Well, hello there. Good evening to all you people out there in live TV. This is a special treat for me because usually you see me on a tape if you see me before. But tonight I get to talk to this whole uh, area here uh, live, which is really exciting. Tonight, too, if you happen to be a musician or you know a musician in your uh, immediate environment, give them a call and tell them to uh, turn on this uh, channel here because I have Geza X tonight who's a... Uh, uh, record producer that's been uh, here in town for what 20 years or so he goes back to uh, the dead kennedys holiday in cambodia for all you rockers black flag and the germs red cross and has then moved into um, uh, rap with uh, worked with ice t and then most recently big success chart topping success with uh, meredith brooks in her song uh, bitch so this is geza geza x hey man thank you very much for uh, coming down and talking with us today um, tell us about your new studio while we wait for some uh, calls maybe to come in and ask some advice on the record business, how we can maybe be successful in the record business. Tell us about your new studio. Well, recently uh, I've moved from a studio that I built uh, uh, called City Lab Sound Design and we're moving the whole thing. My partner Josie Cotton and I uh, jointly own the studio. It's a private facility and we're moving it to the Malibu Hills. So mm. uh, we've taken everything and setting up an entirely new room and uh, you know doing the whole number soundproofing it and everything and setting up all the gear in there uh -huh. so uh, we're you know moving <laughs> that's a big big job huh it's so a you have your own studio. job what made you decide as a producer i want to ask you what a producer actually does for okay. an artist so we get the foundation here mm -hmm. but what made you decide to have your own studio as opposed to using the multitude of other studios here in town is there something unique you wanted to create or what um, I thought I've always been kind of a do-it-yourselfer, so it uh, it was almost just kind of came with the territory, you know. Like when you know I first got involved in the punk thing, which was very very early on, there was this really strong DIY do-it-yourself type of ethic mm -hmm. in, in that scene, and uh, I always just ended up working wherever I was was you know where I also you know gathered together whatever gear was available and. Uh, mm -hmm. d did my recordings that way, so that just carried on throughout my whole career, and and um, and I ended up building a really nice studio that uh -huh. was you know like a converted garage, but it was a real 24-track studio, and mm -hmm. uh, and I like to work out of my own environment basically because I feel like I have a lot more freedom. Uh, I can you know pretty much call the shots as far as the hours and the sort of the methodology which I find can be a little bit stifling I've worked you know as a staff engineer at a lot of studios over the years and um, that's okay but it's always there's people are you know concerned about watching the clock oh yeah etc sure do you find as a producer too it's very important when you work with an artist to try to create a special or unique 
uh, actual environment for that particular artist? I mean, do you, are you pretty much the same with everybody, or do you try to create a certain vibe or something? For, I see. Depending on who you work with, whether it's Dead Kennedys or Meredith Brooks or something. Mm -hmm. To some extent, of course, the uh, recording system itself is, you know, similar from instance to instance, but each artist is unique. And uh, as I get to know them, first in pre-production, which is in rehearsal, and then in the studio, I find that there's certain ways to sort of like either, you know, encourage them or sometimes even like just blatantly trick them into doing their best performances. So that's where a little bit of psychology comes into it. Sometimes you set the mood in a certain way and all of that. Uh -huh. Although, you know, I'm not like usually the kind of person that like, you know, like, you know, dims the lights and lights uh -huh. candles to some extent, yeah. But, you know, I just think that if the studio itself is comfortable and if I create a good kind of attitude that the person feels safe with, then they are going to do their best performances. My studio, as a result, you know, has open windows to the outside, which is very rare. Oh, that's And, nice. uh, you know, a very friendly kind of thing where people can just kind of forget about the studio as much as possible. I see. I want to ask you about what you do in the pre-production and what a producer actually does and a few things like that, some of your techniques. but. But I understand out here we have a call. I hope it's from a musician or somebody who wants some information. Shall we go ahead and hear the call? Great. Can we hear it? We need it coming oh. up in the right studio. I hear it next door. Oh, well, we can't really hear it. <laughs> Hello? Oh, ah, OK. Hello? Hi yes. There. Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Oh, you're high. I get it. Hi, uh, how you doing? Fine. Yeah, Geza, I had a question for you. Who's Whatever, calling? Uh, this is Tony. I don't know if you remember me from uh, Las Palmas Theater. Terrific. Hi, you, Tony. When you were uh, doing live nude psych psychics. Right. How you doing? Hey, what's up, man? Not much. I just, I just turned on the TV. I saw this. I thought I'd call in. Um, you know uh, Stuart Kasem, uh, the uh, sound man over at the teaser? Okay. The dreadlock guy? Sure. Yeah, and um, this is uh, not really a question. I just wondered how I could get a hold of you. Um, we're kind of uh, doing some pre-production right now. We're in a band called um, Electrico, which is um, doing very well around town. And I wondered if uh, we could, how we could get a hold of you to get something to you, maybe let you check it out. I might as well just give out a number then. City Lab Sound Design, phone number 310-317. Two three four two. Okay. And uh, what kind of music is it? It's um I don't people have been describing it as um uh, David Bowie meets uh, Nine Inch Nails. Mary that Sam. sounds cool. Yeah. That, that sounds great. Yeah. So next time you hear uh, Electrical playing, come try to check it out, and I'll, we'll try to get a hold of you. What was that again? What was the name of the band? Electrico. 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 Electrical, okay. okay. I played this oh. band three times. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Electrical, thanks. Thanks for calling. Also, if you want to get a hold of Gaze and you miss any of the numbers, you, there's be a number at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the uh, program here. That's uh, my number where you can reach me or email, and I'll make sure Gaze gets any uh, messages. Cool. Tell us, you know, kind of briefly, what do you do as a producer? What does a producer do, and what do you do that might be unique? I know you really are focusing on radio and singles and which I think is great I'm very interested in that how do you how does a producer how do you focus on a radio sound or creating a single specifically okay there's a lot of different questions there first of all what a producer does is uh, takes you know basically a song in its rough form and tries to refine it so that it becomes uh, analogous to the way that if you find like sort of a you know a, a rough diamond in the ground and then you facet all of the things until it becomes a gem and then you put it in a setting so it becomes a ring and then people like fall in love with the ring. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the same kind of process of refinement. So um, what I have found recently because the industry has changed so much and there's a, a number of things I could say about that. It hasn't changed necessarily for the better. Um, radio formats have gotten so much tighter and playlists are so much shorter and the public's attention span even in a sense is, is shorter because we're in such a you know indulgent and uh, and uh, information overloaded era that um, I've found it a lot more expedient to orient myself 
towards the production of singles because I, you know, I love singles. I grew up with a very uh, hit radio driven sort of era like in the 60s and I think that that's a, uh, a once again become a workable uh, format that album sales and long artist development cycles are kind of a thing of the past whereas the hot single can definitely climb up the charts really fast and drive an album and an artist's entire sometimes unfortunately short-lived career along with it. Mm -hmm. Is there something you do to that you always keep in mind uh, when you're creating a single? Does it is it in the music itself? Is it in the production? You want to get it on the radio? Is there a certain drum sound or what do you do specifically to uh, really hone in on the making the single? Is it a remix? Um, it, it it can end up as a remix, but I'll get to that. Okay. It starts at the ground floor, which is it has to be driven by a fabulous song. You need a song that is really, really strong, so much so that even if it were played acoustically, you could just hear, wow, what an amazing song. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the, of course, the artist's delivery. So that's the core of it. Then from there, building the correct sounds around that concept so that the feeling of the song translates across very, very powerfully to the largest amount of people without necessarily, uh, a lot of people say that it's like appealing to the lowest common denominator. I look at it entirely as the opposite of that. I don't think that you reduce a song so that it's more palatable mm -hmm. to more people, but instead you build it up so that it, in a sense, the same way that something can strike a nerve with, say, the collective unconscious, it's kind of like that, or the collective consciousness. It just hits a nerve that everyone can relate to. Now, the second component of that is that as more and more records are coming out kind of poorly finished, less finished than they should be, sometimes because A&R people meddle too much, unfortunately that's mm -hmm. often the case, inexperienced A&R people downgrade the quality of a record, so the producer is sort of shackled and can't really do his best work, well, then they arrive at a record that is perhaps only 75% complete. And that's that and dance music have spawned the birth of what are called remixers, uh -huh. who basically will take a song, disassemble it, and put it back together again the way it should have been in the first place. And a remixer takes great liberties with the music. They're usually really good musicians, and uh, they may revise the song completely, only keeping certain parts like the, the vocal and certain like hook lines but reassembling it so that the arrangement is better and so that it has other instrumentation. Oh, I see. So you do that, too. Yes. Do you do that, is that what you do on the computer? Is that this Pro Tools I've been hearing about? Correct. You can take a segment, like a surgeon almost? And yes. What's happened is that in the past, <coughs> excuse me, in the past, um, you know, five to seven years, the computer technology has become so incredibly sophisticated that you can record an entire song, all the separate tracks, because you know songs are recorded track by track, as most mm -hmm. people know nowadays. You have all of the instruments on separate channels. Well, those channels are now recorded into a computer, um, sometimes during or after the fact, and um, then they can be just the same way that you do on a word processor. You can take parts of them and move them to other parts of the song, rearrange them, apply sound effects to just specific areas, stretch them so that they're sped up or slowed down, change the pitch, you can do whatever you, you can, want. You can change the pitch of a, a vocal? Yes. In fact, you can That'd take a vocal <laughs> that's completely out of tune and put oh, yeah. it absolutely wow. in tune electronically. Wow, that's pretty good. So what happens is at the end result, the, the producer slash artist has the power to do whatever he wants to uh -huh. a great degree with the song, microsurgically. Wow, that's pretty good. Okay, I, you know, I have some more questions I want to ask you about. Um, Equipment-wise, trends, things like that. But I believe we have another uh, phone call, do we? <laughs> hey, hello. All right. Hello. You have a call for a uh, question for Gaza X? Um, yeah, actually, no. I was just watching your show, and I heard um, a little bit ago someone mentioned the band Electrico, and I actually caught them. Oh, get out of here. Get off the... <laughs> <laughs> I get out of that guy. Night. At the Viper Room. What? Two plugs is enough. Plugs? <laughs> no. They were really amazing, though. Um, uh, three three plugs. Three and, plugs. And counting. Huh? Is in the band too? <laughs> Get lost. I can't do this. <laughs> I'm wise to you, buddy. What you talking about? <laughs> Ask a question or be gone. Okay, I'll be gone. <laughs> They're polite to you, though. I've gotten a few <laughs> whoppers in my day of 
the <laughs> little live show. That's pretty good. Thank you for the call, though. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, trends. You know, um, you mentioned that music moves so <laughs> fast. What should you do? Should I, as a musician or up-and-coming musician out there, if we hear the uh, something that's happening right now, you know, as R. Kelly or whatever, Puff Daddy or something, should I immediately start to um, buy those records and try to create that a trend, or can you anticipate it, or should you just forget trends? Well, it depends on if you want to be a musician or an A and R person. A oh. <laughs> <laughs> and R people. Uh, shamefully tend to copy trends. They lock onto something that they think is selling and they think, oh, that means that's a trend. Mm -hmm. And they will uh, jump all over it and attempt to recreate it at their own label uh -huh. so that whenever there's a whatever, Flavor fill in the blank, yeah. uh, they will go out and sign something identical, hoping that it'll also sell. And the truth of it is, is that you cannot manufacture trends artificially. Trends mm. come from the underground and they come from the grassroots and they are authentic whereas a uh, industry generated trend can to a certain point pump out a kind of a force feeding type of situation where people really have no choice but to buy a certain type of record but unfortunately what happens is it kind of sucks the life out of the pop culture mm -hmm. and uh, inevitably kind of like results in a certain kind of excess like what we saw with grunge right. as grunge became like overly uh, milked to death and the real underground scene sort of got pushed aside now the labels are going well we nobody's buying any records why and they blame the audience which is the stupidest thing that they could possibly do because it's not the audience's fault mm -hmm. that they have nothing to listen to us the labels were totally unprepared mm -hmm. so um, what I would say is that if you're a musician and you feel strongly about what you do, then you're almost like you're forced to, out of intelligence, understand the trend, but not necessarily to follow it, because you've got to mm. follow your own guiding light or whatever you care to call it. Yeah. He's, I'm picking up a few of your things, like the collective unconsciousness and follow your... your <laughs> maybe we can talk about that in a minute, but I think we have another phone call. Oh, I'm lucky. Hello? Hi, how you doing? Hey. Yeah. I, I, I was watching the show tonight. Um, you guys remember who, uh, a group called John Wayne? Heard of what? I'm getting a little feedback. Uh, a group called John Wayne. Haven't heard of a group called John Wayne. Who are they? Uh, there's some kids who put out a record a while ago. Pretty good. Thank you. Another plug. <laughs> or maybe they want uh, some production. Well, <laughs> hey, that's a good idea. That reminds me of a question I wanted to ask you. Should an up-and-coming artist or band, should they uh, approach a, or try to approach a name producer and have them produce their demo? Or is that always done by the record company, you know, after I you see. get a deal? Or how does that work, or is there no rule, or what? If they can, I would recommend um, trying to go, uh, go after a producer. And uh, unfortunately, most of the successful producers are kind of hard to get online but 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 the better ones do tend to uh, you know devote a little bit of their time to finding new acts because that's where a lot of the you know trends or their or their own new work will come from mm -hmm. so so uh, I I if they can get the attention of a producer and the producer is interested in what they're doing then that's a very very good situation often for both the producer and the artist because the artist um, you know, will have the benefit of the producer's experience and the producer might find kind of the next big thing. I would say that as a caution that often it'll cost the artist some money unless the producer is willing to entirely do it on spec, which is, I, you know, sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. So the, my recommendation would be to get the producer, if you can, to just do one killer song uh -huh. and then to use your own demos for the other two or three songs that the label would be looking for. I see. Because nowadays, really, I've found my last four signings have been one song demos which completely is that, is that breaks what they the call the single of, song deal or is that what that is I've never heard that oh. term but I do know mm -hmm. that uh, uh, things have really changed it used to be a three song demo was mandatory mm -hmm. and a lot of labels still adhere to that but really all they want to hear is one song that they can push because they know that the shelf life of an act you know is, is shorter these days yeah I see uh, good I think we have another phone call too cool Phone call? 
Another, another call from John Wayne, the band. Hello. Elect Hello. Let's, let's Hello. Electro or whatever. Hey. Hello. Yes, may I help you? How you doing, Gaza? Hello, I'm doing fine. And yourself? Oh, not too bad. I was watching the show, and I'm not gonna plug any bands or anything. I'm actually uh... except Electro. <laughs> Forget <laughs> about those guys. Uh, anyways, I'd just like to know. Back in the old days, um, working with bands like the Minutemen and Black Flag and and the Dead Kennedys, uh, those. Those recordings were so raw, but the energy was just there. Um, I mean, it was like magic. Yep. And I mean, there's when you're talking about the way the industry is just pumping certain scenes, and uh, there's there's not much of that magic out there right now with a lot of bands that are coming out. I mean, it's so mass produced, um, like this uh, ska core scene that's out. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. And uh, I mean, you're I've right. Heard, you're totally I've, right. You know, I mean, I've heard uh, some stuff like by some of these swing bands, which is pretty cool. You know, like uh, bands like Big Bad Voodoo Daddy or Royal Crown Review, and that music's kind of cool. But I mean, it doesn't have like that. I mean, that stuff was done back in the 20s and 30s or wherever that right. came from. And I mean, when the guys like the Dead Kennedys and the Minutemen were, you know, these guys who barely really knew anything truly about music, but they it, they had they poured their heart and soul into all those recordings, stuff like uh, that first uh, Dead Kennedys record, uh, Fresh Fruit for Rotting Vegetables. Right, which I is, did that. I mean, to this day, could stand up against any anything that's out right now, and it's just so awesome. That's I mean, cool. I mean, did you, I mean, you must be uh, really proud of uh, being part of that whole scene. Yes, I am, and thank you for bringing that up, because uh, th definitely that was one of the uh, highlights of my life. It was such a vital and energetic and community-oriented sort of scene. So do you have a question that goes with that, or would you like me to comment on it? Oh, okay, he's gone. Um, yeah, I really appreciate you for that. was a very intelligent sort of uh, uh, comment. What I'm thinking is that that one of the things that happens whenever the music industry hits a lull such as what is existing today, what happens is that artists are almost forced into a vacuum and there's not really that much new uh, stuff coming, bubbling up from like the club scene. So what happens is that artists just tend to naturally regress to their roots in blues, funk, swing, whatever, because they're looking for some new synthesis of styles that tends to bring a new uh, cultural movement into an existence. So, so it's what's what I'm seeing now is almost like the perfect barometer for for what what is really taking place, which is complete atrophy of the music scene. And uh, the what you generally happens next is that some little underground thing that's hidden from view will begin gathering its resources and and turning itself into something meaningful. I see that happening in the rave scene. Um, more than anywhere else, and um, and not really very much in the surface uh, club scene as you, whatever the, all this you know ska and swing stuff. I mean it's it's okay to a point, but really it could have came and went a lot lot more quickly. This being said, um, w is there any alternative to? I know you're focusing on the on singles and getting the bands on the radio which is totally the highest echelon of mainstream, right? And then, is there any alternative for these bands? They're gathering their resources or whatever. Is there any alternative way to get known, to get radio, or to, to have that blossoming? Am I making any sense yes. whatsoever? I don't know if I am. I don't think so. There's always been like this really radical gap between sort of like the commercial success part of the world and the life on the streets and in the clubs part. And uh, it just sort of harkens back to my prevailing theory that the music business is the last bastion of feudalism in the modern world. Wow. And that is because you have these sort of like, you know, kings and dukes and uh, nobles and monks and priests kind of controlling from the castle walls the guilds, which are the craftsmen that are sort of are allowed to be inside the castle walls. Those are the signed musicians. And then you have the rest of the musicians, which unfortunately are treated as peasants, <laughs> doing the real you know, bulk of the music for nothing. They're getting nothing for it, except the satisfaction of making art. 
So, um, and that is every single thing about the music business uh, basically supports that theory, even down to the archaic and, and cruel, really, exploitive sort of contracts that record mm -hmm. companies used to exploit artists and cruel. I mean it's 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 pretty amazing what happens. It's a very suppressive and you know misguided set of standards. So what I'm saying mm -hmm. is that um, yes, I personally am striving for commercial success with, you know, hit singles because that is the cream of the cream in a certain way. And to me it's the, the ultimate roll of the dice and it's like it's the challenging work because it's trying to create a three minute distillation of the pop culture that will click with the, the widest amount of people while hopefully maintaining in my own uh, artistic center some sense of integrity. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a wild ride trying to do that. But my advice to artists who are um, trying to become successful is, is to attempt to uh, do it in stages. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. a lot of the middle ground is missing from our culture. The club scene doesn't really pay enough to support artists so they have to have a day job, mm -hmm. meaning that their lives are twice as hectic and they have to get strung out on speed just to function or something, you know, I mean, I'm mm -hmm. half kidding. But um, nevertheless, you know, you have to learn how to do a lot of it yourself before you can be, you know, taken into the Capital. record industry to the point where you can be legitimately exploited. <laughs> right. <laughs> I can't believe it, but that time Alrighty. just flies. I want to thank the callers, too, for, um, for the very good, excellent phone calls. Better than my last time when I got those obscene phone calls. <laughs> but it uh, probably has to do with your intelligent answers. It was great. Well, anyway, uh, if you want to get a hold of Geza for any reason or myself, there will be a phone number or email at the end of the program. And, and thank you very much for watching. Good night. Oh, <laughs> my